Vladimir Putin's approval rating continues to rise in Russia ever since the invasion of Ukraine last year. Meanwhile, the last remaining voices of the opposition are being silenced. Thousands have been arrested on charges of treason, and despite all possible Western sanctions, the Russian economy is still thriving. If anything has gone bankrupt, it is the democracy in the country. Prominent critics of the regime, such as Vladimir Karamursa and Alexei Navalny, have been sentenced to long prison terms. Others have gone into exile. Those speaking against the war are perceived as enemies of the state, spies and traitors. On To The Point, we ask, Russia under Putin, why is the opposition disappearing? Hello and welcome to To The Point. I'm Isha Bhatia Sanan here in Berlin. What is going on in Russia? On the one hand, support for Vladimir Putin is on the rise. And on the other hand, any kind of opposition is leading to arrests. To understand this, I have three incredible guests with me today. Ilya Krasilshiska is a Russian journalist. He faces 10 years in prison for allegedly spreading fake news on the killings of civilians in Ukraine. Ilya had co-founded Medusa, a Russian-language web news outlet based in Riga, Latvia. Ksenia Kremer is a historian and author. She is currently a visiting research fellow at the Leibniz Center for Contemporary History in Potsdam, Germany. And Ulrike von Hirschhausen is also a historian. She teaches at the University of Rostock with a special focus on empires. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining. Ilya, I'd like to start with you. Now, you have been uh, charged for spreading fake news against the Russian armed forces, and that was an Instagram post. Yep. Now, what is really happening in Russia? Are civilians being really monitored so much? Is there absolutely no freedom of speech there? You can be, uh, you can speak freely, I think, when you are in your apartment. Surely, uh, I think uh, this is still the, not the North Korea. You can speak somewhere, but the problem is not to speak. The problem is that you never know what will happen next. Sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes the consequences are horrible. So there are, for example, uh, 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 for example, the story of the girl uh, Masha Muskalova. She uh, um, pictures. She made some picture in school. This was an anti-war picture, and uh, her father was arrested. He tried to escape, and he was uh, arrested again in Belarus. And she uh, she was sent to uh, the orphan house. So everybody know the stories. Yes, the stories are horrible, uh, and you never know what will happen. So yes, I, I posted the, uh, I posted the, uh, on Instagram about Bucha and what I did. I say I, I, I said that this is a Russian military uh, Russian military is responsible for this uh, massacre. That's enough. That's uh, enough to put you behind bars and yeah, you enough. could be jailed for up yeah, to 10 enough. years. Yeah, yeah. Senior, um, Leveda Center, which claims to be a non-government independent research center, has said that Putin's approval rating, they have gone up from 70 to more than 80 in the last one year. What do you make of this research? I think, I think we need to be very cautious with the statistics we use and how we use it. When you said Levada Center claims to be independent, I think we have to take it with a grain of salt. And sociologists warn us that any statistics applicable to, to despotism, to authoritarian societies, um, is not very reliable. I think this is also the function of those figures is to create a semblance of majority and to demoralize those who oppose the war. Nevertheless, I do believe that there is a sense of acceptance of this war. I mean, there is a whole range of reactions from enthusiastic approval and endorsement and willingness to volunteer for the front um, to, you know, tacit acceptance. Maybe we don't like it, maybe we don't want to participate, but we do not mind. And I think with this war, Putin taps into a whole gamut of reactions and feelings and concepts imperial resentment and the sense that Ukraine is ours, Russia's, to claim back, um, that are there, that, that they have circulated for years. So it's so propaganda. I wouldn't trust statistics, 
but I wouldn't um, nevertheless dismiss um, a whole complex of attitudes which is there, which permeate the society, which explain the endorsement and this whole ra range of reactions. Mm -hmm. Ulrike, talking of the same research, it also mentioned that the only time when the rating slightly dipped, that was when um, partial mobilization was announced, that was September last year. Now we are talking about mass mobilization. Do you think the people, the civilians in Russia, they will unite against it? I think we have to differentiate between the metropoles, where lots of polls are taken, actually, and the regions. I mean, we have about 80 regions in Russia, and it's a completely different situation out there because the ethnic minorities from this region are primarily drafted. In Moscow right now, we have 0.5% of the adult male population who is drafted, and in the regions, we have up to 10%. So there's a huge difference who sh shares or who wears the burdens of this war. So I do think that if there is some sort of disapproval, it will rather be in the regions than in the centers. And speaking out against the regime or criticizing Putin can be extremely dangerous in Russia. Legal action may result in life sentence. There are, however, some dissenting voices who are willing to sacrifice their own freedom in their fight for the freedom of citizens. Vladimir Karamurza's trial is over and the verdict has been pronounced, guilty of high treason. The former journalist had criticized the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 25 years of imprisonment in a strict penal colony, 25 years. I want to remind everyone that this is the maximum sentence for a person with no previous convictions. Ilya Yashin was arrested after he protested the Russian invasion in a YouTube video and denounced war crimes committed by the army. Among other things, he drew attention to the atrocities committed by Russian soldiers in Bucha. Yashin has been in jail awaiting trial ever since. What imprisonment in Russia can mean is demonstrated by the fate of Russia's best-known opposition figure, Alexei Navalny. After barely surviving an attempted poisoning, he returned to Russia voluntarily in 2021 and was arrested immediately upon his arrival. The most recent pictures of him show an emaciated man marked by illness. Can Putin silence his critics in the long term by locking them away? Ilya, can he, can Putin silence his critics by just filling jails? He has many options to silence critics. Uh, he can jail them, uh, he can, uh, he, uh, or you can leave, or you can, it, he can poison them. So we, uh, for example, we see here uh, Alexei Navalny. It's hard to, me to, to talk about it because I know Alexei and uh, we met a lot of times, and every time I, I see this, it's, it's hard to see. So he was uh, uh, sentenced not for 15 days, and then 15 days, and then 15 days. Then he was uh, poisoned. Then he left to uh, Germany. He spent uh, a month uh, in Charité uh, here in Berlin. And then he came back, and right, right now he jailed. And he had jailed for, uh, I don't remember, seven years or eight but years. But now he that has doesn't, terrorist It doesn't charges. matter. Yeah. Then he became an extremist. Then he will be a terrorist, and he will uh, get a life sentence. And he, I, also, I need to say that he, the prison, uh, this is the camp where he is stated. So this is a horrible place. So, um, for example, uh, uh, yesterday the FBK, the organization, Alexei Navalny organization, they pub uh, published the video when the former uh, prisoner of this uh, camp, he described the camp. For example, this guy, he spent 14 days tied to the uh, wooden, uh, wooden um, bed, uh, just he was tied for 14 days. And uh, he, right now, actually, he's in uh, a, um, a military organization called Wagner, yes, which uh, is fighting against the Ukrainians in, uh, in Ukraine. And so, as we know, the Russia, uh, Russian, Russia is uh, training the prisoners and sp send them to the, uh, to the war. And we have questions, why? Why people go there? This is deadliest place on the earth. This, that's mm -hmm. why when you were, was for 14 years tied to the bed, this is better for you, yeah. 
But maybe I can give an argument why do people go to the war who are not uh, drafted? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's an economical argument, um, and a yes. lot of research has been done recently on that. So a normal income would be 600 US dollar monthly, and what they are paid to fight in Ukraine for Wagner are 4,000 US dollar right now. This is sort of the highest uh, income you can make, but this is a considerable difference. And because all these ethnic minorities in rather p sort of poor regions are drafted also for Wagner, this is an incentive. So I would say that the economical argument is one among many yes, explanatory yeah. factors why people go to Ukraine and kill Ukrainians. And they're also being promised that they will not need to go back to the prison yes, if they fight. Yes, absolutely. So that promise will be yeah, kept. Yeah, and there is a promise of sort of resocialization because those institutions are absent in Russia. When you, um, when you are released from prison, there are no channels that resocialize you in, in normal life, so to say. So people bounce back and there is a very high percentage of re-offenders in Russian prisons currently. It's higher than people who are there for the first time. So Wagner is a promise of certain respect, uh, resp uh, respectability and a career Korea and, um, and money. And I think that we need to mention this uh, economic reason as one of the reasons behind the approval because it's a social mobility vehicle for many people. In terms of careers, some of the careers are now vacant, people have left, opening those career opportunities to those who could not really claim those jobs before. And there are payments that the government promises to those volunteering for the front, signing military contracts to their families in case they die. So there is a um, financial incentive there on the table very clearly. Some people who are there involved in this conflict, they never had such financial opportunities before, unfortunately. And Ilya just talked very uh, briefly about uh, Navalny's condition mm -hmm. in the prison. Now, we know about a handful of opponents who have been jailed and uh, about the situation that mm -hmm. is there. But give us an idea of what a jail in Russia is like, because there are a lot of reports about physical abuse, about sexual misconduct. Yeah, um, and the, these reports are true, and then uh, we know that such practices have intensified um, for the last nine seven years. Um, sexualized violence, rapes have been common and these are the rapes conducted by other prisoners against the people that the prison administration or penal colony administration wants to subdue and subjugate. This is also one of the instruments through which people are co-opted into cooperation with um, security services because those tortures and sexualized tortures are videotapes and videotapes are later used to blackmail people into obedience, into conformity. Russian prisons are places of torture um, and abuse. And so for a lot of people, um, I mean, they miscalculate. They think that the chance of dying at this war is um, lower than the chances of being abused, harassed, raped and, um, you know, killed um, in a Russian penal colony or prison. These are horrible places. We have to be clear about that. And those, May I add here yes. a little bit because uh, I, I co-anchor the podcast about the Russian jail in Russia. And uh, what, what do I see? I see that the, so Russia changed a lot in the last, uh, last century, but the Russian prison tradition, mm -hmm. it didn't change. So the Russian jail before the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, after the Soviet Union, uh, Stalin's prison, this is all the same, yes? Uh, the prisons, some, many yeah. prisons are the same. They are 150 years old. And uh, starting when you so you you go to the jail and then for example when you are so you are jailed you are sentenced and then they send you to the, to your jail it can be weeks in a train uh, and this is like a Stalin's train there are seven people in one block yeah they live together they, they have no food and then you go go to the prison there are two types of prison for example the black prison and the red prison. One prison, the, as far as I remember, the black prison is controlled by the administration. The red prison is controlled by the prisoners. So the, this is a system of torture. Mm -hmm. This is a system of killing people there inside. The, the, there is no idea of change people there. Mm -hmm. and maybe I can sort thinking. of add to what Ilya is just saying because we have this historical tradition of criminals in the Russian army. Mm -hmm. Um, because in the 19th century, the village selected who had to go to the army. And they, of course, didn't choose the strong ones and the healthy ones. They s chose the criminals, the mm -hmm. most incapable ones, to just mm -hmm. put them away in the army. 
Um, and this is kind of a long tradition also in the Tsarist Empire. Um, I don't know about the Soviet Union, but I do think that we have an ingrained tradition which is now revitalizing mm -hmm. under the condition of war. You have also written about how crime has been normalized in the Russian society. Can yeah. you elaborate on that? I think um, we need to remember also about the prevalence of criminal experience in Russian society and the sheer numbers that tell us that a lot of people have criminal experience or have been socialized into this experience by virtue of having parents, grandparents, relatives or neighbors who have criminal experience under their belt. Um, I think in 2007, I might be mistaken about the date, um, a Russian newspaper, Kamersan, published a sociological study claiming that almost 18% of adult male population has um, a form of felons, effectively, which means that those criminal norms percolate into normal society and they inform different spheres of life, attitudes among people, the ideas of machismo, patriarchal structure, um, sort of veneration of force, subjugation, um, certain cynicism. Um, these are values that percolate from prisons into regular society. And there is another aspect to that, that um, criminal mentality conceives of itself as an authentic form of being. And civility, proper, polite society conceived of as artificial, fake. And you see that very often in the language spoken by, by the Kremlin. Putin himself mm. uses criminal argo a lot. And I mean, his diplomatic service shows the middle finger to the world effectively using some of the language which was unthinkable some you know, 20 years ago. And this is, um, I think, a sign that Russian society or Russian regime is a criminal regime, not only because it commits crimes both in Ukraine and in the country, but also because it it is governed by a set of particular ideas and concepts that in Russian are known as panyatia that percolated from this very widespread prison experience. But, but does violence, that also have a nationalistic think? sentiment to it? Um, the, uh, you mean the violence or the... The fact that we have to die for our country, no matter what. Oh, this is a tough one. Um, I think it can be abused by, by, by propaganda, but I think, of course, this criminal mentality is also very selfish and individualistic. It can be channeled into particular uses, but I think essentially, you know, it is there just what you make of it politically, how you frame it, how you shape it. Adding on that, what you were just saying, I do think that uh, the propaganda managed very successfully to make that sort of fighting for the country and what you were just saying, dying for the country, um, is part of this kind of re-imperialization project, mm -hmm. sort of seeing Russia as an empire. It is no empire right now. We have an imperial policy, but we have no empire. But that's what mm -hmm. they want to sort of, you know, uh, construct. Um, and it fits very well to uh, attack Ukraine, part of the Soviet Union, um, to restate this imperial vision of Putin. And I do think that a lot of people in Russia buy that through the state television. I, Maybe may I add? Yeah, I think that uh, it's still an empire uh, yeah. with the colonies. <laughs> and actually, yeah. this is the old empire. This is a weak empire. And this is an imp imperial war. And the, uh, actually, uh, the empire used colonies and sent people from colonies to this war. So that's why uh, in the, in not in metro metropolis but in the regions there are so many drafted people. Mm -hmm. Yes, they draft people from the colonies, from uh, Buryatia, for example, from Yakutia. There is a lot mm -hmm. of people far east. and the far east. And uh, w uh, speaking about the empire and the metropolis, this is actually the war about metropolis because Putin thinks that the center of the empire is Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. And mm -hmm. For him, the European uh, Ukraine is the debt of the uh, death to empire because this is his metropolis for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. This is a one country, one center of empire for him, mm -hmm. and that's why I think this is imperial war, uh, and that's why he is so nervous about this. He wants to save this empire, and this is a really old, old construct. Yes, and that's and this is a real. Uh, old type of war. That's why we see something from the past. Talking of old construct and things of the past, now statistics also, also show that more than 80% of Russians, they regret the collapse of USSR. Mm -hmm. So do people really want um, the Soviet Union back? I, they don't, uh, most of the, these people, they don't know what they want. Yes, this is just their sentiment. They want, the. this is like Trump, we want to, we want to make the uh, Russia great again. What does it, what does it mean? I think that most of the people don't can't a answer this question. Okay, we want a great country, and everybody in the world should think 
that this country is great, should be afraid of us. What does it matter? What does it matter? They want to live better, maybe, but I, I'm not sure that people can answer this question. What does it matter? What does it mean to come back to the Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. But I think one answer on that question is one of the three divisions, which sort of, you know, are the biggest problems in Russia right now, and one is age, the other one is social inequality, and the third mm -hmm. one is territorial unevenness. Um, and I think age is a huge factor explaining also why the majority of people beyond 70 probably are prone of having something like a remembrance of the Soviet Union back. But there's a you know, young generation, you are a representative of them, who are very far from <laughs> wishing post-Soviet -so situations back. So we have to look at age to differentiate who is very pro-Putin regime and who is silent right now. I would even say they are against Putin, but they are silent because there's no other choice. They are silent but they're also thriving. Now, there's no other country in the world that is subject to as many sanctions as Russia. More than a 1,000 foreign companies have left Russia in the past year. The aim is to exert pressure on the Russian government by weakening the economy. But the Western pressure tactics are proving to be futile. Bags, clothes, shoes. Moscow's market for secondhand goods is booming. This jacket is made by our local brand, and it's much cheaper than foreign-made ones. We used to go shopping at H&M, but now we can find the same clothes here. Everything is available at a tenth of the price. It's business as usual in Moscow. Despite the war and sanctions, like here at Swede House, the new IKEA knockoff from Belarus. Like many other Western companies, IKEA withdrew from Russia after the start of the war in Ukraine. Many global chains, like McDonald's or Starbucks, now have a Russian equivalent. Those with money hardly have to do without anything. Western brands are also still available, via middlemen on the Internet. The Kremlin is clearly pleased the Russian economy has not yet collapsed. The positive trends in the economy are strengthening. According to economic data, retail revenue has increased by just under 25 percent since the beginning of April. Consuming instead of protesting, how much does the good economic situation help Putin? Ilya, how do your friends and family back home look at these changes? Which way? Economic changes? You can... the, the new market that has come up? Uh, I, I can say that a lot of things... They, they live in, in Moscow, and I can say that a lot of things changed there. So people li lived, they can get anything they want to but get. But is there a sense of pride that now we can buy more Made in Russia stuff? The, no, no. Really? This is <laughs> this is not made of Russia. So there was an IKEA right now. This the, it has this different brand, but this is all the same. They have factories in Russia. Okay, there was a McDonald's right now. It's called. Uh, um, Kostne uh, Yam and that's it. Yami and that's it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so this is all the same. This is all the same. They just sometimes the, right now they started to nationalize some. Uh, uh, Western companies, and uh, before that, they just uh, uh, pushed uh, the Western company to sell it for for cheap for some uh, controlled uh, businessmen. It's it works like the same. So I have uh, some examples. For example, there is no Coca Cola right now uh, anymore in in Russia, but if you go to the uh, food chain called Azbuko Vkuso with the luxury products, you see five types of Coca Cola because they are. Uh, they imported it from different countries, mm. and you can choose right now. So that you can, uh, so right. somehow you have more choices than before. We are we're coming towards the end of the show, Senya. How long can Putin really sustain this? The economy, as well as the, uh, keeping the opposition in check. In one sentence, if you can. I think infinitely. I think you know we are looking into some some very prolonged process of you know Russia as a sort of nuclear swamp continuing to rot, and that can take years, unfortunately. But I think a lot depends on the um, on when we have when Ukraine wins the war, definitely. 
that that's going to be a decisive factor here. Rodrigo? I would say Putin can keep the opposition in check for a long time, but he will not be able to keep the economic situation in mm -hmm. check for very long because it is a completely different situation than the one which the propaganda gives. And there will be a steady deterioration of the economic system. So I think this is the key point for Putin to face in his own country. Thank you. Millions of Russians have fallen silent since the beginning of the war. Many have fled. Thousands have gone into exile. If you're watching this on YouTube, do let us know your thoughts. Why is the opposition in Russia disappearing? Thanks for watching. Goodbye.